This is the 15th episode in a series about designing and building a clock for my relay computer. Last time I finished off the PCB design and sent it over for manufacturing by JLC PCB. Well a week later and those have arrived from China and hence I can continue on with soldering the board and giving it a test. Before we get going though let's compare the 2D render from last time to the real thing. Here's the front and here's the back. And don't these things always look so much better in real life? Well, I'm pleased with it anyway. And as I mentioned last time, this PCB, laid out this specific way, is a unique thing, and unique to me and how I approach PCB design. Right, let's get to the workbench. And here's my relay clock card, all ready for components and solder to be added. This card is actually the lucky one in that respect, as I've got five of these, given that's the minimum order from JLC PCB. And, mistakes aside, the other four cards will likely never be used, or get to feel the warm touch of soldering iron. Anyhow, enough whimsy, let's crack on. I'll use my cheap PCB holder to make soldering just that little bit easier to manage, although I have seen others, like Big Clive on YouTube, do soldering with a PCB and solder in one hand, and the iron in the other. I'm not quite that ambidextrous, so find this holder quite handy. I like to start off by soldering in the four IDC connectors at the back of the card. This kind of flies in the face of good advice, which states you should solder the lowest profile components first, and then build up to taller components as you go. But this is how I like to do it, so I'll stick with it. For each connector I solder one corner pin, and then the opposite pin diagonally. This gives me a chance to make sure everything is well lined up, and make any adjustments which is important for these connectors, as they need to line up with a backplane in the computer. Right, happy with those now, so I can now solder each of the remaining pins on each connector. Let's speed through this a bit now, as you'll soon get bored of watching me solder. Actually though, for me, I do find it quite relaxing once you get into it, and it's a very tactile hobby. That said though, it can have its frustrations, and here comes a big one. Everything was soldering nicely until this last IDC connector, which just won't take the solder, and that's down to a flaw in my design. The cross shape you see here is called thermal relief, and it's designed to limit the amount of heat that can be wicked away from the soldering iron into the ground plane. This effect shouldn't be underestimated, as copper is really good at conducting heat, and the iron, or at least my iron, won't be able to heat up quickly enough to combat that wicking effect. So I've got thermal relief here, so what's the problem? Well, these connecting lines are way too wide, almost to the point of having no effect at all. What I should have done is something more like this. This would further limit the amount of heat transferred into the copper area, allowing the pad to stay hotter and the solder to flow freely. There's a balance to strike with this, but in this case the tracks are still wide enough to take any current likely to flow through this area, and if I reorder this board, it'll be much easier to solder. This sort of evolutionary design is all part and parcel of making PCBs, and I'm not going to be too hard on myself for missing this flaw. Besides, it's nothing compared to something else I missed, as you'll see later on. Let's continue on, and I've now got the IDC connectors in, and I've also soldered in the two toggle switches. These switches also suffer the same thermal relief design flaw, and as such took ages to get the heat up enough to take the solder. Oh well. Next I'll get the diodes in, and I'll go for these Zener diodes first, cutting them from the paper tape. I've got this really handy 3D printed component former, which lets me bend the legs at a set distance. That helps achieve a nice tidy and uniform look, and just makes it easier to get all the components into the board. I'll bend the legs back slightly, so they don't fall out. And it's on to more soldering. With soldering complete, all I need to do is crop the leads. And there we go. And the pattern repeats. Prepare the component by bending and forming the leads, place in the board, solder them in, and crop the leads. I think you get the idea now, and you can no doubt imagine what soldering the rest of the board looks like, so let's skip forward in time. And here's the completed board. At the front here, there's four red LEDs at the left, and these are for the relay clock stages A, B, C and D. Next is the two green LEDs for the resulting clock output, and this is shared by both the relay and crystal clock. For all my cards, I tend to use a colour code of green being an output from the card, yellow an input to the card, and red an intermediate result or state. The middle toggle switch selects between the crystal and relay clock, left for crystal 
right for relay. Next is the crystal clock speed selector, and then at the far right is the main power switch, on to the right, off to the left. One thing that's not been explained to date in this series is the extra bit of PCB here. This is an additional design I do for my cards, and it just helps position the LEDs and keep everything together. Let's venture up the card and see what we've got. Here's the four stage ring counter, and it's made up of the resistor capacitor time delay components, flyback diodes, and then the relays themselves. I've mounted these into sockets as they'll be switching way quicker and more often than anything else in the computer. In other words, if anything is going to fail first relay wise, it'll be these, so being able to easily replace them seems sensible. On the right is the crystal oscillator circuit, leading up to the frequency division and frequency selection ICs. After that it's the clock divider circuitry, and again this relay will be busy, so gets a socket. And then finally on the left, there's the halt latch, which will handle freezing the clock. As per the PCB design, the card is broadly split in half, with the relay clock circuitry on the left, and the crystal clock circuitry on the right. Two clocks, one card. Let's take a look at the back of the card, and things here aren't so pretty. Here's the mess of solder around the power connector, where soldering was incredibly difficult given the thermal relief design debacle. And that's a bit of a theme going down the board. Everywhere there's a connection to the ground plane, the soldering was a nightmare. Yep, even the smaller ground pads have the same problem, and my design should look like this, rather than this. Going further down the board, and... Oh, what's all this about? Well, this is an even bigger design flaw, and somehow I'd not noticed there was no ground path on the four relay clock stages. So this... is supposed to look like this. Might not be obvious, but on the second picture, there's the connections into the ground plane. Now obviously my PCB isn't enjoying the benefit of this hindsight, so it gets a hack, and I've used Kynol wire, to hook into the nearest available ground connection. I did laugh at the time trying to work out how I could have made such an obvious fail, uh, but these things happen, and it's actually likely I will order the new design in and rebuild this card at some point. Anyhow, last point of horror is the ground shield connections on the switches, and these were by far the worst of anything on the board, and again, all due to, yep, you guessed it, the overly chunky thermal relief on these pads. The fix as for everything else is to make this look like this. Besides all these ground connections looking really ugly, there's a more important issue, which is most of these connections will be dry. That is, they probably won't be making connection to the pads, or, worse still, will make an intermittent connection. You'll see an example of this later that I'll point out. Something I'll do to help these dry joints is heat the whole card up as much as I can without melting components, and then get the soldering iron onto the joints again to remelt and remake them. Because there'll already be a lot of heat stored in the ground plane at that point, it should combat the wicking effect. So that's all for another time though, so let's crack on, tempt fate, and see if the card actually works or not. And here's my test rig, all set up and ready to go. 12 volts comes in over here from my usual power supply off camera, and that passes through to the card here. Here I've picked off the outgoing clock line, and passed that to my oscilloscope, so the clock signal can be observed and, more importantly, have the frequency measured. So let's start with the crystal clock, it's set for the slowest frequency, and there we go. The scope is set at 500 milliseconds per division, and the trough here is four divisions long, making it two seconds. So that's a four second cycle in total, and the quarter of a hertz frequency I was expecting. This is interesting here though, there's a big negative spike on the rising edge, and I'd guess that's the relay turning off somewhere where the EMF spike isn't being suppressed by a diode. The diodes are there in the design, so this is almost certainly a dry joint on one of the diodes. And given this is the crystal clock output, it's likely to be this one right here. Anyhow, this is going to be a bit of a theme, so let's plow on and uh, try changing the frequency. Rotating the switch clockwise one position selects half a hertz. And indeed we see that coming through on the scope, with a two division peak lasting one second, meaning a cycle of two seconds. Rotating again, we get one hertz. And again, we get two hertz. At this point, the scope is now picking up the frequency, showing that it's bang on two hertz. 
I'll move the time base out a bit now, and this is where the trigger point diamond here can lock onto the changing signal, making it a bit easier to observe. Rotating the selector clockwise again, we get 4 hertz. Then 8. And 16. And finally 32. And it pains me to make the relays run that hard, so let's turn anti-clockwise back through 16. 8 and onto a more comfortable 4 hertz. Right, so that's the crystal clock working okay. Let's flick over to the relay clock. <laughs> yeah, a much more nostalgic sound and accompanied by an appropriately rough clock signal. And as uh, covered in an early video in this series, that's expected, but uh, you can see it's roughly 6 hertz, which will do the job. So next let's test the freeze line, which is active when the run stop switch is put to the stop position. Here I'll connect that line over to one of my test board's momentary switches. Let's check for the relay clock first. And... Yeah, you can see the clock is freezing in one of two positions, ensuring the clock line is always low at the freeze. Let's check the crystal clock next. Yeah, likewise, that's uh, looking good. Let's slow the clock down to see that freeze logic. There we go. See how even though I activate the freeze line, it only takes effect once the clock has reached its next off period. At that point the freeze takes effect and keeps the clock low until I release the button. Cool, ok, let's uh, hook up the halt line and for that I'll need this reset switch hooking up and that's representing the restart switch here. I can then hook the halt line up to my test board, just like the freeze line, and I'm good to go. Clock on, and a flick of the halt line, and that's the clock halted. Note now that the halt and freeze lines have no effect. It's only the restart switch that can get things going again. Let's try that again. Good. Okay, how about the relay base clock? Oh yeah, helps if I put the restart switch back. Super. And, oh look, a dry joint on one of the LEDs. <sighs> Let's try that a bit more. Good. And the freeze line. Yep, still works. So that's it then. Dodger soldering aside, the clock does actually work as intended. And that's pretty much it for this video then. The next episode will be the last, as all that remains now is to fit the card into my computer, set up all the front switches, and give everything a test. Oh, and uh, one more thing. It'd be nice if my computer can let me know when the halt line is triggered, effectively meaning my program is complete. Well, this might come in handy. What do you mean it's not very loud? Ah then, maybe this'll help a bit. As always, thanks for watching if you made it this far, and I'll see you all next time.